abuse, including adolescent girls in gender education and development research with a focus on Tibetan girls in China. So why should scholars and practitioners care about adolescent girls? There are a few points here. First of all, <laughs> um, it, adolescence is an intermediary life stage between childhood and adulthood, and it's also a time when girls are taking on new roles in their societies. And so these factors can impact schooling and are also interesting sites of negotiation and renegotiation. I think this is an important point because in developing programs and projects and policies that address adolescent girls, it's important to consider their roles in society and in their particular contexts. So I'm going to be looking at literature in adolescence and gender education and development to focus on which of these three views of adolescence is most relevant for studying adolescent girls and their educational trajectories in Tibetan areas of China. My th three gender approaches are WID, post-structural perspectives, and anthropological perspectives. Within WID, I'm focusing on social rates of return and gender parity. So social rates of return are the social cost of education subtracted from the social benefits such as reduced infant mortality and increased GDP. In terms of post-structural perspectives, these are often ways of analyzing a word. For example, analyzing the feminist modern or the ideal Muslim educated girl. And in this particular case, I'll be do using a critique of the feminist modern, which we talked about in terms of Varus. And I'll also be looking a little bit at how genealogy is used to trace constructions of educated Muslim girls across time. My third body of literature is the anthropological perspective of gender education and development, which we haven't talked about in class. But basically, this entails um, more ethnographic research and what it brings up in terms of adolescence is a lot of negotiation and renegotiation of what it means to come of age as an educated person. So now I'm going to be talking about biological view, or three views of adolescence and the ways they work with WID and post-structuralism and uh, anthropological perspectives. So the first one is biological views of adolescence. And in this case, adolescence is considered a process of biological and emotional change. And I looked at two groups of WID scholars, Montgomery and Oster and Thornton. Both of them were asking the question, is menstruation a barrier to gender parity? And you'll remember that gender parity is necessary to achieve the social benefits of education. And they both conducted studies where they pro, uh, provided menstrual products and or puberty education to see if these would affect the, the school attendance rates. And in Montgomery's case, they did reduce absences. But in Oster and Thornton's case, they found that menstruation did not actually impact school attendance. So my second group is socio-historical and post-structural perspectives. Um, in this group, it's adolescence is considered something that is constructed. <clears throat> For instance, in the US, adolescence was created in order to remove young people from the workforce during the Great Depression. As for gender education and development scholars, I chose Koja Mulji's 2018 book about um, forging the ideal educated girl. And she was looking at a, a variety of texts from the early 1900s and then 1947 to 67, and then the early 2000s to see how each of these time periods reflected each other or built off of each other or were different. And I included a picture of Malala here because for the early 2000s, she 
discusses how Malala's book portrays her story and then also how her um, more recent Western presence has kind of repackaged her story in terms of Islam as a limiter to education, which brings up the idea of culture as a cause. My third group is the anthropological view and a socio-cultural view. And I included this picture in particular because it is from my own context. This is a Tibetan hair changing ritual that happens when girls are 13, 15, or 17. And it signifies that they are now um, marriageable. They're of marriageable age. And I think that will be valuable in my research just as for Stambach um, discussing the ritual initiation and circumcision, as well as high school graduation as different ways of becoming adults. I appreciated Stambach's work and also Adeli's for the fact that they both talk about how gender and um, respectability are constructed throughout daily practices with between students, parents, and teachers. So I've chosen to work with this anthropological perspective to gain a more nuanced understanding of how adolescent Tibetan girls understand their educational trajectory and what it means to be successful women, because I'm not exactly sure what I will find. So I'm not ready to take on a more narrow framework, such as a WID perspective or even a post-structural perspective. And I think this is important to acknowledge because when we are looking at situation, it's easy to fall into the trap of that World Bank report with those gender paradoxes. And we may carry some of those same blind spots um, in the way we see things. So by taking an anthropological perspective, we can make sure that we're looking at specific contexts. Thank you.